Hey everybody, welcome back to the tech stream. Uh, my name is Joran Barras, and today I'm gonna to tell you all about scripting in Flowable. Let's get going. All right. So, so my name is Joran Barras. I am a core developer working on Flowable open source. I am a architect working on the enterprise products. And before this, I was the one of the activity co-founders that did Jables JPPM. And before that, I was a BPM consultant in Belgium, uh, where I live and I was born. Um, we're gonna look at what is scripting, why do we have scripting? Why do we care about it? I'm going to show you some demos. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, the recent improvements in the last release, the upcoming release, um, some demos and our future plans. Of course, uh, if you've been following this stream so far, there is many options to chat. There's options to do Q&A, ask all the questions. The moderator of this stream is Tess Rademakers, my colleague and friend. So make his life really difficult by asking lots of tricky questions. All right, let's get going. So computers, that's where we start. So computers, since they were created, uh, invented, they are very simple things in, in reality. They uh, take a set of instructions and they execute them very, very fast and without errors like we humans tend to do. Um, they have evolved fantastically. However, their main purpose still has the same. They execute a set of instructions. Now, these instructions, they now come from the cloud, for example. They used to come from punch cards, from floppy disks, from CD-ROMs, you name it. Um, but their purpose is still the same. And whether you are filling in your Excel sheets, whether you are playing a video game on your television, or whether you're watching cat videos, it's all the same. The computer is doing a set of instructions. It's executing what you tell the computer to do. And that's, this is where the script part comes in. The script is a high level set of instructions that are executed on such a computer system. And scripts are often meant for extension, customization, or automation. And the word script comes from the movie industry where the script defines you know, which actor says what and how the set needs to look like. Now, in the you know, uh, computer industry, there is a difference between programs and scripts. Now, these days, the, the lines between them are getting a bit blurry, but let's say historically, there's, there's two big differences. A program starts from the source code and you feed this source code into a compiler. The compiler then creates a binary for various architectures. You can create a binary for, let's say, Intel Windows. You can create a binary for Mac. Uh, on Intel or Mac with the M1 architecture or the M2 architecture. The point is a compiler creates this binary for us and then you run this binary. A good example of this is for example, Microsoft Word. We all know that looks very different on Windows than it looks on uh, Mac, but they share a similar, they share parts of their code base. Now a script on the other hand, you start from the source code and you feed that into an interpreter. That interpreter is just going to run the source code as it is reading it and it's showing it on the screen, for example. Um, a browser is a good example of such a thing. Um, the website comes in with the HTML, with the JavaScript, and the browser just interprets whatever comes in and it executes those instructions. Now, this is of course a bit of a simplification because you need um, interpreters for the various architectures you have, right? Uh, if you think about the browser, Firefox, for example, there's a different binary for Mac, there's a different binary for Intel Windows, et cetera. Right? So you simply are shifting around with the responsibilities there. Now, when it comes to Java, and Java is the language that the engines of Flowable are built in, things are a bit messier. Java uses a kind of a hybrid mode. It starts interpreted, but then compiles on the fly to machine code. And it's not even that simple. Basically, we take our Java source code, we give it to the compiler, the compiler creates a class file, and then these class files are interpreted on what we call the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. And there's different JVMs for different architectures. Um, the point is, the idea behind this, back in the day when Java was created, is that you write it once and run it everywhere. I can give you my class files and they will run on your JVM. Um, that's basically how Flowable works. Now, this is a bit of a simplification. I know, again, when you're talking about JIT compilation, there's way more to it, but let's, for the purpose of this talk, uh, keep it there. When we talk about classes, we need to mention the class part. And uh, to do that, I'm gonna tell you that Flowable, since the beginning, has had support for uh, writing custom logic in service tasks and in script tasks. Um, 
service tasks is you basically write your Java code, which we call in Flowable a delegate. It is written in Java and it needs to be on the class part. Now the class part in the JVM is nothing more than the different locations where the JVM is going to find and load the classes from. But the main point is that when you write such a delegate, the code is compiled to code that is just living next to, let's say the global engine code for the JVM, there is no difference between the compiled global engine code and your compiled delegate. Code. A script task, oh yeah, and basically uh, class parts, I know technically can be dynamic, but if you want to do that, you're in a world of pain if you really want to make that work without memory leaks and let's not go there today. Now, script tasks, on the other hand, they're, the scripts are written in a script language. Uh, we support Groovy, JavaScript, and maybe a few other ones that I will show you later. Um, and they are interpreted as we reach this, this step in the process. For example, if we have A, B, C, and B is a script task, the engine will simply interpret the script at that point in time as it reads it from, from yeah, the process model. And technically, any language can be interpreted. I mean, even Java can be interpreted. But again, that's not the purpose of this talk. I mean, technically, it's possible just so you know the differences between what is a delegate and a script task. Let me quickly show you how that looks like. And I'm going to, you know, try to do something dangerous here. I'm going to do a live demo. And I'm actually going to start with a new Maven project. So I'm going to do this demo 01. Uh, this is fine. And let's create it. Here we go. Again, there's all of things that can go wrong here. So let's keep our fingers crossed. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a dependency here to make sure that I can build against the global API. So let's add a dependency. Here we go. I'm going to depend on the global platform tasks and I'm going to go now and create a new Java delegate. Here we go. New package. I'm just going to call this com Acme you know, just a generic company name. And I'm going to create my delegates. Here we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement a Java delegate, but this is the interface from Flowable and once an, you know, once an execute method. All right, we can now implement it. Now let's think what we could do. So one thing I want to do is something very you know, advanced, so to say, is I want to create a process that simply is going to add two numbers together. I'm going to show you the difference between the script and the service task approach. So let's quickly create the demo 01 app here. Here we go. I'm going to create a process. I'll tell this one the um, demo 01 process. Here we go. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have a user task. Uh, let's call this one input. What I'm going to do is not advanced. I'm going to simply ask the user for two numbers. Again, the purpose is not really about forms. We had the previous session for that. So I'm going to call this one number one and the other one number two. There we go, quite simple. And what I want to do afterwards is I want to show something. I want to show the result on the screen. All right, so again, I'm going to create a result form. And let's say that the result will be stored in a variable called result, right? There's not much imagination when it comes to naming here. Um, and now, of course, the magic for this talk is I'm going to use now a delegate. So for this, I need a service task. And I'm going to link them all together. There we go. And in there, I'm going to use my class. Remember, I used com acme, and then I did something like com my delegate. Again, you know, this is a very basic demo. I can use delegate expressions, expressions. I'm way more advanced. But I just want to show you the, the, you know, the difference between the two kind of approaches that we have here. So there we go. Uh, if I'm going to run this, it's going to get the two numbers, and I want to add them together and then show the result. So let's go back to our IntelliJ and write that logic. So the first thing I want to do is I want to get the number out of it. So let's say that's number number one. I'm going to just get it out of my execution here. This was number one. I already passed it to the right thing. And this is just the same thing, but then number two. So we're getting the variables out. And then I want to create a new variable, which we named result. And this is basically number one. I give the int value and number two, the int value. All right, that's it. Um, I now, of course, because this is a Java delegate and I need to get this on the class path, 
I now need to get this on my uh, Tomcat. I'm running a Tomcat here. I could run you know, Java jar or other ways to run it, but I just use a Tomcat. Um, so what I now need to do is I need to use Maven. There you go. To create a jar file. A jar file is a way to package um, basically these, uh, these, these Java classes in a nice distributable form that's understandable from all the um, web servers like Tomcat. And I didn't expect it would be downloading things here at a very slow speed. So bear with me uh, for, a, for a second. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's what you get if you do live demos, of course. So let's see what happens. But you know, you can trust me that um, I'm going to give it like 10 more seconds before uh, I'm going to swap to this. Oh, there we go. Finally, I should have complained sooner. All right, here we go. So I now, you know, I've got now a jar, right? So I can now copy this jar into my Tomcat. Now I'm going to copy my jar, which is called demo zero to one snapshot. And I have my Tomcat and I learned this from the top of my head. Uh, here we go, flow fast demo. I've got a Tomcat there and I'm going to be a bit lazy. So I'm going to copy it into the flowable work. Uh, web inf library. Here we go. This is now copying it to the class part of this Tomcat, and this is my Tomcat. I'm going to reboot it. Here we go. Um, now, the why I'm spending so much time on this is because I want to show the pain that is involved with adding these things to the class part. I mean, um, this is something that is not trivial to do, and it's definitely not something you can give to you know any user. This is the, the person doing this needs already to know what is the class part, how do I write Java, etc. So here we go. I have my server running. Let me quickly see if everything still is up and running. Here we go. I'm gonna publish this. I'm going to flow work. If I create new now, it should have one process. Continue, yes. And if I do one plus two, fingers crossed and I get a result back three. So behind the scenes, it has called my Java delegate and has executed it. Now, let's see what happens if I make this a script. So simply say, I want to now make this a script. Here we go, let's create a script for good measures. And in the script, I simply want to do now the same thing as I did before, execute set variable, result is number one plus number two. There we go. That should be it. I'm going to now save it, deploy it to my runtime system. There we go. And start it again. And if I do 999 and one, complete it. And here we go. I got 100 back. All right. So, well, you have to trust me, of course, on this. This is the correct. Uh, so you see that it's changed the name. That's why I changed the name, actually. So you could see that it's a new process. But the point is, I didn't have to do anything with my Tomcat, Classbot, or anything else there. Right. So let's continue. So let's have a quick look at the pros and the cons here. Right. The, the pro of the service task is quite clear for, for people that know compilation versus interpretation is that the compiled version is faster. That's, that's clear. Um, the second pro is that because my delegate, my Java delegate is not part of my model, I can do bug fixes easier. I can actually deploy a new uh, version of my, um, of my Java class onto the class pod and I could fix any bug that I've created, which is also the downside. I mean, the first downside uh, below there is that because it's not part of the BPMN CMN model, versioning becomes actually quite harder if you have many versions and you need to take into account bug fixes for version one versus bug fixes for version 100 stuff like that um java as you saw has proper ide support proper unit testing support i have all the tools to my disposal to do really advanced stuff i have a fast feedback cycle i have a compiler that checks my mistakes any typos any API that i've not been using correctly the compiler fixes that for me of course as you saw i need a reboot to fix the class path and you need quite some tech skills to be able to do this. Script tasks, on the other hand, they're slower due to interpretation. Um, there is less IDE support for them. I mean, I don't have like an IntelliJ I can use for this thing to, to print, uh, to, to type it out and stuff like that. There's a slower feedback cycle, right? Mistakes are often caught when you're trial and erroring things and a typo, the compiler is not going to help you to tell you, hey, you made a typo or you called the wrong method. But I didn't need a reboot, and I need less technical skills to actually use custom logic in my process or in my case instance. And of course, the same thing applies as we had for the service task. The script is part of your VPN CMN model. So bug fixing things becomes harder. Um, you're talking about migration and all of those things at that point. Um, but it could also be a benefit, right? Because 
it is included embedded within that version that you've deployed. So if you're running version one, it will have the version one of that script as it is embedded. Now, we've seen in our community, in, in our customer base, that um, there is a lot of demand for scripting. And the reason for that is, according to me at least, this is my theory, is that everything is or is becoming software. I mean, I put the article there on the right-hand side from the famous BMW thing that went on a couple of weeks ago where they, um, with a software flag, enabled or disabled the uh, seat heating in, in their cars, right? The hardware is there, but the software is driving it. Everything is or is becoming software. And there simply are not enough software developers out there to build all the software that is needed, which is also the reason why we saw or we see the rise of this, what we call the citizen developer. You know, if you're interested in that, there's a whole business track going on right now, concurrently talking really about what is a citizen developer, how do you, you know, make your apps like that. But the main point for us technical people is there needs to be a sophistication in the tooling that we have to write this kind of software. And at the same time, We've seen a huge wave of abstraction in the infrastructure space or the DevOps space, as you as you like. Um, we've seen the rise of Docker, Kubernetes, where containers are these pre-packaged things, and um, changing them, changing the class path on these containers uh, or Helm charts or whatever, um, is not that easy. It needs quite a bit of technical skills to build these new pipelines that take in the original container, add things to the class path, and you know this is not trivial. And scripting is just way easier if you're talking about these pre-packaged kind of things like in Docker and Kubernetes. Our philosophy from global side has always been that you should be able to extend, to plug in as easy as possible, whatever you want. So scripting makes a lot of sense for us. And our goal is really to offer scripting for extension, for logic, wherever we think it makes sense. And if you have any kind of use case that we've missed, let us know in the QA and we can talk about it uh, after this uh, presentation. Um, in, if we look at what the things are that we recently improved, and you might not have yet noticed this, is in 3.12, the last major release, we now support service registry models with scripts, which means that the, the downside or the positive side, depends on how you look at it from before, is gone. Scripts don't need to be embedded anymore within your process, within your case. You can have different models all referencing the same script service model. And let me show you how that looks like. All right. Let's go into design and let me create a new service model. Here we go, service, I'm just gonna call it my service because I have not much imagination. Here we go. I can now select instead of expression or rest, which were there before, I can now select script. I can add an operation. I can call this one the, the awesome calculation. There we go. Now, the cool thing about a service model is that it, it requires input and output parameters. And the reason for that is that it makes things easier to test and it makes things easier to reuse. So I'm gonna add two parameters. I'm gonna call this one the first number and it's an integer. And I'm gonna call this one the second number. And again, this is also an integer. There we go. And I'm gonna create one output uh, parameter. I'm just gonna call this one result. And it's also going to be an integer. Here we go. And finally, you can write a script. I can use JavaScript or I can use Groovy here. I can also use a custom script if I have it installed on my class path. If I, for example, have Jiton uh, or JRuby or something that, uh, you know, with, with a bit of fiddling would also work. So what I'm going to do now is I'm simply going to do the same thing as in my script, but with a slight difference now. So let me use this. I'm going to explain this in a second. I'm going to use the FLW uh, namespace. And I'm going to say set output. Output. I'm going to say the result is the first number because we're now in the context of the uh, the service model, and add the second number to it, and that's it. Add the operation, save it, and let's now go to our process. Here we go. I'm going to remove my script here, and I'm going to drop in a service registry task. There we go. Hook it up together and select this nice uh, service, my awesome calculation. And you see now why I had to do the input output mapping because I can reuse this in BPM and in CM and in other places. I now need to map my, my process instance variables to the actual variables that the service expects. I mean, this is really to cleanly separate them and to have really reusable services um, that you can you know, use whatever you want. So I'm gonna 
to number one here. I'm using expression here to resolve the value, otherwise it would, would inject a string, something we don't want. And for the output, yeah, I use result, and I'm just gonna say result here. All right, that should be it. If I didn't make a mistake and I publish it again, then this should now basically have the same features, right, as before, three and four should be seven. And if I look at my demo process, you see that it's now actually the service registry task. Now, because this is a reusable model, let's quickly try something that I didn't practice, but I just think it will be fun to see what happens. So I'm gonna create my case and I'm gonna mimic this thing exactly. This was the input, oops, the input one. And in the input one, I'm gonna reference the same input form. The other one was the result one, there we go. I'm going to reference the result form and I'm going to use the service registry task again and map it to the service. Same thing as in BPMN. See, it's exactly the same thing as in BPMN. If in my case, I have now a different variable, but I reuse because I wasn't lazy, we use the same form. So it's again going to be number one and number two as the variable assistant is telling me here. Here we go. And we just do result because that's what the other side of the user task is expecting. Let's hook this all up together. This is done here with a sentry, an entry sentry on the thing. And this should be it. Let's see what happens if I do this. Publish this and create a new case now. Yep, here we go. Three and nine completed. And here we go, 12. So you see that I really reused my service model. I didn't write any specific code for cases, for executions or whatever. Um, and I could really reuse this and I have one, you know, one central place where I can now manage these things. All right, pretty cool. But we're ignoring something fundamental here that the Java compiled world is giving us, APIs and backwards compatibility, right? So when we talk about APIs in the compiled world, my source code, I mean, my source code now is super simple. I mean, just adding two numbers together, but you can see how this becomes something way more contrived. Um, in the compiled world, the compiler was checking whether I was not having typos, whether I was using the right method, the right types, passing the right arguments and stuff like that. In the interpreted world, I have nothing of this. Secondly, is that what becomes crucial when you talk about uh, scripts and APIs is backwards compatibility. If I use some methods in the FLW uh, namespace, for example, I want to have agreements that this won't change. In scripting, there is no compiler, so there's nothing checking this for you. Um, so having guarantees from, let's say, global side from us on these APIs that I will show you in a second is becoming really, really crucial. That's also what we guarantee, right? The stuff that we're doing now is guaranteed not to change it because for scripting, this is so crucial. And if we won't, we would lose so much power that we have in the compiled world. Now, a few examples of the things we added in 3.12, which you might not be aware of that's there in the scripting. You saw already the flw.set output, but if you're working with strings, there's many kind of functions out there. For example, I, you know, the contains method for uh, checking whether a, there's a substring in a certain string. I can split strings. I can you know, escape HTML. There's you know, many there for string manipulation management. Um, if you work with dates, and you know all developers love to work with dates, there's a lot of kind of little functions that can help you to parse dates from one format to the other. You know, from an instant to an you know old school Java util date. I can add seconds to hours to days. You know, uh, compare dates, stuff like that. That's that's all there and available on the FLW time namespace. Um, if I'm doing maths, if I want to sum something, if I want to, you know, maximize an array of values, that's there. If I want to format dates, format currencies, it's there. If I want to get working with locales, which is important in countries like, you know, myself in Belgium, where we have three languages, um, it's really important to get the right language in front of your customer. Yeah, there we have some tooling for you that does that. So the point of all of these things is that by giving you this higher level abstractions is we hide the implementation for you. You don't know, you don't need to care what the parsing of a certain date is or currency transformation. We also guarantee that in the future, if you use this function, that it won't change. Even if we change the implementation due to you know, new frameworks, new libraries, they will still behave the same. So that's really, really crucial. Another problem, and that's where we come to the point of the, you know, the set output that I was showing before, is to have really reusable scripts we must get rid of the low-level usage that we have today. For example, in the BPMN script task, you have 
execution get variable in a case instance case instance get or set variable in a task listener get or set variable you know this if i want to make really portable scripts that i can use in any place that has to go away and i already kind of spoiled it that's why we have under the flw namespace the get input to get any kind of variable and the set output that will set it correctly um, for you now, the point is that this API will know implicitly where it's being called from. If I'm calling this in a case instance, it will do the right thing behind the scenes for you. If I'm doing this in a process, right, but you don't have to care. You simply use get input to get whatever you want. Also the same for set output. We will make sure it's set on the right thing. This means I can reuse my scripts that I written for a script task in, let's say, a task listener or an execution listener or a case instance lifecycle listener. I can reuse these scripts really in a way that, you know, I don't need to copy paste things around. And again, we are guaranteeing that these things will remain the same, which is crucial for scripting. In scripting, we can't, you know, change methods on the fly. We can't change behavior on the fly because scripting is very fiddly. You don't have a compiler, right? Another thing by using this get inputs and get outputs uh, function is you have an implicit input output mapping, and which means that you now have a little unit of, of logic that you can test in isolation, right? If I have my input, if I have my output, I can test this with various inputs, checking that the output is as, ex as I expected and things work. If I do a change, that things keep working as I wrote in my unit tests. Another thing we added in 3.12 is uh, an API for working with JSON because many users, many customers of us use a lot of J JSON for many kinds of use cases, which makes sense because many external APIs also talk JSON. Um, we put all of this under the flw.json namespace. Um, but again, you don't need to worry about imp implementation. We are using Jackson now behind the scenes in the back end, but doesn't matter if it changes in the future, we will guarantee that things remain the same for you. Um, and if I want to work with JSON, there's things like string to JSON, and it will transform it into a JSON variable, right, which is persistent in a very specific way in the engines. I can create an object in JSON. I can create arrays. And it also works nested. For example, if I want to create the, um, the structure on the right-hand side with nested and a value and an array there, uh, well, on the left-hand side, you can see the kind of script logic that is needed. So flw.json. And I start to create my object and then nested. I'm creating a child object, adding the string, creating a child array, and then setting the output. Now this output, the my var, will be stored as a JSON variable type in the flowable engine, which you know it's not uh serialized or something in a special way. It's really stored in a proper way that we can work with it. And one thing that is new in 3.13, that's in the upcoming release uh, coming next month, is we heard from, from customers that, uh, yes, it's really cool. We've got this get input and working with JSON, but we also need a way to kind of dive into the JSON, right? And that's that's why we added in 3.13 the pod method. So we can really go, like for example, here in a certain response, go into a certain pod, go deeper in the priority, and then cast it, let's say, as, as an integer or a string or a long or a double or whatever, right? So really guaranteeing that you get the right type because scripting languages don't really have types. So it's sometimes hard to get the right type out of there. And these methods, they guarantee that you get the right type out of them. Let me quickly show you how that looks like. All right. So, and to do this, I have created another demo app. And I'm not going to do this live um, because there's chance that I will do some typos here. And again, I don't have a compiler, right? So what I have here, I've got on my machine a uh, service running. Now let me quickly zoom in into the service. This is a mock REST service and it's responding this JSON response. So this could be a third party API. In fact, it is running on their local host on their slash third party API. And there's a bit of a, yeah, it's a bit of an annoying service in the sense that it will return me a, not even a list, it will return me an object of issues with a certain ID and a certain title. And then very awkwardly, it is going to put some metadata in another object. It's going to then in a nested array say, which are the valid issues, right? And it's going to put the priorities in yet another JSON object. I mean, if you would write this yourself, you would of course make this nice and you create an array, put all the metadata inside of the elements, but hey, we can't control this. So we have to live with what we have. So that's what we have. And if I now look, what I did is I have an issues service. This is a REST API. I've mapped this to my localhost port 3000. And I already created a fetch issue call, which is a simple REST get 
mapped on the third party API. Remember, that's the one that I mapped it on here. And there I simply am going to uh, put the response. Here we go. Put the response as is, as a variable, exposing it as a, a response variable. And I'm simply going to copy the full, full response body. See, I don't want to bother at this point with trying to map it. I'm just going to put the whole thing as JSON into whatever is using, whatever is calling this REST service. If I'm now going to my uh, process, what's going on here is after the start of the process, I'm going to call this service. I'm going to you know, map it into the response variable and I'm going to process them. And this is where the stuff, of course, that I want to show you today is this is where I'm writing a little script. So let me zoom in again. So what I'm doing here is I'm getting the response from you know, the REST service. And I am simply using the FLW get input method to do so, right? I don't care whether I'm in a process or a case or a listener, right? I simply want to get the response. The end result is going to be a list of issues because I don't like the fact that it's like an, an, a JSON object. I want to have an array and you'll see in a second why. I want to have an issues list. I'm going to create an array and I'm going to save that here at the end. I'm going to store it as lists, right? I'm just simply going to do that. And there's going to be a JSON array. Then I'm going to use this new path notation. I'm going to go into the info. Remember, the info was the second uh, JSON object. I'm going to get the valid issues, and I'm going to create an iterator. With that iterator, I'm simply going to loop over it. I'm going to ask for the ID uh, of you know what's a valid ID. Of course, it's a script, so I can print stuff because I'm you know if I'm debugging, could be useful. Yes, professional developers also still do this. Um, and then what I want to do is I want to match this particular valid ID from here, I want to match it with the issues kind of uh, object that matches the same ID. So that's what I'm doing here. So here I'm actually getting from the response, going into the issues, JSON object, and in using that ID from the other array to find the data about the issue. The priority is in yet another uh, JSON object. And again, using the pod notation, I'm getting it getting it as integer. And just to make things interesting, I also said if the priority is below 50, I don't care about it. But if it's above 50, then I'm going to add to my list that I created above a new object, right, using the flw.json notation, put a string in there, which I get from my, you know, from the first JSON object of my REST request, and then the priority from the other part of the REST request. So really what I'm doing here is kind of normalizing the response, right? In reality, when you're integrating with many third-party APIs, and these could be old APIs, They're, the formats is typically not what you expect. And with these scripts, I can actually fiddle to make them as I want. Now, once I have this list, right, this list of issues, what I'm doing here is I'm simply using a multi-instance uh, user task. So here I am doing a parallel multi-instance using my list here, injecting my list into it. And for every issue in that list, I'm creating a new element variable. So there will be one task for each issue. And let me quickly show the form here. And for each one of them, I'm going to show the title, the priority, and just a comments field. All right, let's publish this to work. Here we go. And let's do the handle issues. So here we go. It's going to call now my REST API, my mock REST API, in my local system, and it's going to you know, make the format nice with the script, and it's going to put that create multi-instance user task for me. Here we go. If I go into my process, you can see that, you know, these are the ones that were valid and which had a priority higher than 50. I have now three new user tasks as part of this process, and I can go into them, and the title and priority is actually nicely coupled, right? Handle issue cannot upload form, cannot uh, resist that, uh, and this is the right, correct priority. Here we go. Okay. But there's more. If we look at what's coming in 3.13, scripting is getting a lot of love. What I did now is I had a REST request and then I did the scripting. Well, there is actually no point in why I should be doing that. It's nice for you know this demo, but in 3.13, we actually added a, a way to add a script handler for a request and a response to do anything with you know the request before it's being sent to the REST service or when it's coming back. So I could move my logic actually into this response handler and make sure that anybody that is using this service gets the same nice format, right? It's embedded within the REST service, reusable across my BPMN processes, cases, and you name it. 
Actions, right? Actions, if you're in work, these are these buttons. If you click them, it does something. And you can show a form or you can do any custom logic. Well, it now supports scripts. So if I now want to do something in a script, do some logic, yeah, it's now possible in 3.13 to actually just write a script and don't need to put anything anymore on the class path, which was the case before. I can now throw in 3.13 a BPMN error from anywhere. So in the flw.bpmn namespace, there's a throw error method. And I can just throw that anywhere. And for example, here it is done in a listener. I can catch it on the sub process boundary and have a really nice visual model uh, that which simply wasn't possible before uh, with, with, the, with what was there. There's also some low level changes that I really like. Uh, for example, if you had an error in 3.12, it would show you that, for example, no such property, my service. Um, in 3.13, we actually enhance the tracing uh, for our scripts. You get now like, okay, it is uh, this particular uh, tenant, this particular process definition or case definition, this particular uh, activity. And in a big app, this makes all the difference for error, you know, finding the right place where the error happens, right? By the way, um, uh, did you know that if you have an exception, like when scripting, you can just see these in Flowable Inspect. Um, so if you have an exception, you have Flowable Inspect open, you will simply see that there's going to be a red button. You click it and you get the exception straight away. You get these tracing information straight away in Flowable Work. Right. Last part, looking at the time here, got five more minutes. Future, right? What, what's the stuff that we're thinking about right now? Again, you know, a legal disclaimer. These are ideas, prototypes we're working on right now. Nothing of this is real. So, you know, don't uh, start calling our sales team that you wanted today because simply it's not there. But this is really what we're thinking about that we should do. And let us know in the QA what you think we, what you like or what you think we should be doing. So we're making, or we have made scripts a first class citizen, but we could go further. We could make something that I call the scriptorium, just the name that I gave it. Uh, the scriptorium used to be this place where monks in the medieval times were sitting, copying textbooks all day long. Um, so the scriptorium is a place where scripts live and the scripts could get their own life cycle. I can reference them from anywhere. I just showed you now BP Man, C Man, the listeners, but you know, templates, uh, channels, imagine a channel for an event registry use case where I'm doing something with the incoming event with a script, right? That should be possible. And if we have the central location, will be possible. And once we have a central location, the scriptorium, right? It will be super cool if we have full blown ID capabilities in the browser. Think about like an embedded Visual Studio code that you can have with all the kind of uh, code completion, syntax, uh, highlighting, all this help in inline all the stuff we are you know, used to from our IntelliJ, from an Eclipse, whatever you use in your browser, that will be super cool. But also if you have this central location, if you can write unit tests at the same time and run them whenever I have a change, run them in the central location, you know, and have pipelines integrating, right? We could expose a REST API to call out these services, do these scripts and do fancy things with it, right? Another thing is visualization. Where is where is which script used and why and stuff like that. All stuff we're thinking about, stuff we're prototyping, and you know you might see in an upcoming release. One thing that uh, I really like is uh, the ability to edit scripts live in Inspect. Right. So um, if you're fiddling with the scripts and you're you know just trying something out and you always have to go back and forth between design and work. That's not really nice. So one of the things we're thinking about is offering a way that you can live edit your script, immediately deploy it live to work. We have, you know, that's quite a simple thing to do technically, and um, just see if your script works. And if you're done, you can press a button and yeah, port it back to design, right? I'm done. You give it back to design and use this now in the new versions of my model. Really cool stuff. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is sandboxing, right? In scripts, it's really easy to make mistakes. And sometimes you make things like infinite loops. You use a lot of memory or you access things that you shouldn't, right? Now, normally this is not a problem. The people that are modeling, they are building software, right? Because Flowable is, after all, an application that allows you to build software. So modelers are like developers and they uh, are typically trusted. But when you talk about shared environments, and if you've seen the uh, talk from Tess earlier today, you know that we're looking into uh, these kind of SaaS things. It's a no-go, right? So one of the things we're experimenting with right now is, for example, with Graal.js. Graal.js is uh, the scripting engine from the Graal VM. If you don't know what that is, you know, go to the link there on the screen. But basically, it's a flavor of the JVM that offers us a scripting engine that gives us basic sandboxing in the community edition, things like limiting access to uh, JVM classes, 
uh, disallowing IO, uh, stop infinite loops and stuff like that. The enterprise edition of Gravium actually does more fancy things like monitoring the memory, monitoring CPU, and really allows you to isolate, sandbox uh, your, your stuff. Let me quickly show you how that looks like. So what I did here, I've got a very simple uh, setup here. I got a simple unit test with a uh, process. The process is a very simple, you know, hello world is kind of a start, script, and then end. And what I'm doing here is simply looping until forever, right? This shouldn't fail, but in reality, it will fail if I don't have anything special in my core uh, scripting engine that does that. So if I run this now, uh, then you will see, of course, it needs to compile, and there we go. This is not scripted, this is compiled. And of course, when you're demoing things, it always goes slower than when you were practicing it. There we go. So I'm booting up the whole global engine, uh, using an H2 in memory database, and there we go. And bam, there it stops. It said here, because I configured it internally in my GraalJS engine to only allow for 1,000 statements, it says, I'm done. Right? In normal execution, this would basically run forever. Right? So that's the stuff we're looking into right now, which is crucial for our uh, SaaS offering that we're uh, working on. The last thing, the last slides, uh, is uh, another thing we're looking into is looking at, at it a very different way. Instead of sandboxing it locally, why not have something like I'm deploying a Lambda to AWS, to Azure, on the fly, when I'm deploying my process, when I'm deploying my, my case, compile a Lambda, post it to AWS, and call that Lambda whenever I'm reaching that particular point in the process or case. Now, of course, there are you know, huge network, uh, new huge implications due to network latency uh, here. The performance is not going to be the same as just doing it locally, but you get through isolation. Each Lambda, each serverless function is really isolated uh, from the others. And yeah, that is, I believe, my last slide. We talked about scripting, why we have it, we give a demo and all of that. And uh, yeah, this is what I had to share. So the end, and I'm hoping now that the moderator of the stream test is uh, joining soon. Yeah, th thanks a lot, uh, Joram. That was really uh, a nice presentation. So mm -hmm. um, uh, we got quite a couple of um, uh, scripting questions coming in. So I'm just going to fire them at you, right? <laughs> right. Um, so uh, one of the questions was that scripts are powerful and, and, and you talked about sandboxing capabilities, but there's also the possibility to do a deployment or uh, change the deployment as uh, using the, the flowable APIs. It, would there be a way to limit such a usage of yeah APIs that you would not want yeah. uh, uh, to be used? Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, that's uh, actually that's something that we already have in open source, but we haven't really um, promoted it as such. Um, uh, I mean, it's not the proper word anymore. You have these lists where you kind of say which is allowed and which is disallowed, right? Uh, and you can say you can you can have by default you can disallow everything. Right, and say, I don't want to have access to any APIs, but I want to have access to these particular APIs. I mean, that's something we already really have today. We're not exposing it as we should. That's a good point. Um, but definitely, that is that's a possibility. And that's, a let's say, a cheap way to do sandboxing. Now, it doesn't stop everything, because somebody that knows like extreme reflecting in Java, for example, could, do, could craft something with reflection. Uh, I mean, we could also stop reflection. That's another thing. But I mean, yes, there is possibilities, but it's not as simple as, as that. But that's exactly the stuff that we're looking into um, as you know, right now. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so another question is, uh, how could you handle script exceptions? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. And actually, in 3.13, that's one of the things we have really worked on is with the for example, the FLW throw error kind of thing. So in theory, you could already try catch it, throw that error, and nicely handle it in uh, your BPMN or you know CMN kind. Of, oh, not in CMN because that doesn't support BPMN errors. Um, but basically, that's already a quick way. The other way to do it is that if you have an exception, um, you could you could. I mean, this is already quite low level. You would need Java. You can't do this right in scripting. Uh, you could attach some handler to that to really do it on a global level. 
I'm more a fan of doing it visually. I really think that if you have exceptions, you should think about it in a modeling way, right? Even if there are technical problems, but really think about handling those things um, model-wise, uh, I would say. I don't know if that answers the question or what's the intention. Yeah. That's no, I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, maybe an easier question. Uh, would, would there also be support for FLW, set transient uh, oh, yeah. output? Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, yes, we actually need to add that before the 3.13. <laughs> That's a very good yeah. point. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I think that makes all the, all the sense. Uh, one thing that I had originally also in my presentation is that we now put things in the FLW namespace, but technically, and you need Java you know, to, to put this on the class part. Technically, if you're a company, Acme, right? It is quite easy to add your own Acme namespace to the scripts and add your own functions to the scripts. So <clears throat> that becomes... Sorry for that. So that becomes, you know, really easy to offer these things. If you have like, I've got my own APIs, I want to offer them to my users. That's quite easy. I, you know, I didn't have it. I, I removed the slide on the last minute because of time constraints, but yeah, very good question because I could touch it now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think something you have been thinking about as well, um, which was asked, um, will there be debugger support for <laughs> scripting? It's a very good question. Um, so uh, basic debugging is uh, not that hard to do. Uh, I mean, scripting is quite easy because you start from the beginning and you read to the point where you are. So if you talk about cheap debugging, it's really about uh, knowing where I stopped and keeping the state somewhere persistent and the next time you go through it. It becomes more complex when you have things like loops and stuff like that, um, which there are also solutions for, but they're not that trivial. So it's definitely something we're uh, looking into or, or prototyping those things, but we don't have a clear answer yet that works in all cases. But I would love to have that to really, you know, bring that uh, into, well, it's going to be global inspect most likely to, to at runtime debug these things, see what happens. That would be super cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah, then a, a nice question. So it says uh, Sandy Kemsley. Um, Hi, Sandy. So, uh, uh, um, is Feel supported as a possible scripting language? No, no, right now it, it isn't. Um, now, technically, for, for us, it isn't that hard to add it. It's more of a question, you know, we haven't had much questions around that particular support, especially on scripting and to add Feel there. Um, if I personally would, you know, my personal opinion, if I would add a new language, I would actually try to add a language that's more like Excel in the sense that if I look at my parents, my wife, anybody, you know, who's not in IT, that's the scripting language that everybody knows, right? And having something that's close to Excel would be something that I would love to build one day. But, you know, who knows, right? But, uh, yeah. So I'm also in the question with uh, <laughs> Sly <laughs> missing, but... Uh, it's something we can do. It's we have to look at the demand from customer base and stuff like that uh, for that. Yeah. 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 Maybe a final one. Um, do you plan to add support for um, doing HTTP calls uh, right. from a script task? Yeah. I mean, it's not. It, it hasn't made a three thirteen cut, but I think it's definitely something that will come soon uh, after that because. I think it makes a lot of sense to kind of encapsulate these things. I mean, just flw.htp. Do a request to something, right? That um, makes a lot of sense in in some use cases. Um, I do like the fact that uh, myself personally, I would always use a service model for you know because then you clearly define the input and the output parameters. But I can see that people sometimes just want to you know get something quickly done and. No, we should give you the tools to, to do that, right? Even though I would argue, please use a service model, it's way cleaner. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely something we heard from many people and it's something we will add, yeah. Cool. Then um, I think we have reached the end of the Q&A, so we will answer any remaining questions uh, uh, later. I uh, want to say thanks a lot for your presentation, your you listening and moderating, um, Tess. Appreciate it. Yeah, so we, we will continue with uh, Philip um in 10 minutes uh and there's also the business stream uh, which will continue uh, uh even a bit later uh so we will see you in a bit thank you later bye bye